Uh, our last presentation is going to be provided to us uh, through uh, WebEx. It'll be uh, on Lyme disease diagnosed by alternative methods and similar syndromes, research approaches to take us forward. And that'll be given to us by Dr. David Patrick, who is a professor and director of the School of Population and Public Health at UBC. Dr. Patrick, welcome. Thanks. Good morning. The floor is yours, sir. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, I want to start by uh, commiserating with any fellow West Coasters who got up at the crack of dawn to join the meeting and by thanking the organizers for uh, getting us involved. Um, I have no commercial conflicts of interest with uh, laboratories or um, uh, pharmaceutical companies, and my research is funded by uh, CIHR, NIH, and foundations. I think um, I like the tone of the meeting uh, so far. We're fundamentally here because people are feeling sick. Uh, there's no question that we have um, an epidemic of an illness uh, that is debilitating a lot of people, and we have to get to the bottom of it. And I think that's, uh, that's appreciated on all sides of this discussion. Um, I'm a big fan of Louis Pasteur. Uh, now, he was the father of medical microbiology, and he said we shouldn't be justified in devoting further time to opinions which are not supported by serious experiment, meaning you have an idea, you test it, and if the idea doesn't quite work out, um, you move on to the next thing. And using that strategy, at the tail end of the 19th century, within 20 years, 18 plagues that had harmed mankind for millennia were elucidated. I'm talking about TB, leprosy, typhoid, and so forth. And really, Willy Bergdorfer followed in this fine tradition of past years. Now, um, I, we've heard from, uh, from Dr. Fallon quite accurately that there are scientific problems with imperfect case definitions. And so when we talk about a broad group of people with Lyme disease, or any other label really, it's possible that there could be several groups of people sick for different reasons within that grouping, if we're not careful. And that imperfect case definition leads to the research problem of misclassification. It's like having apples and oranges in a fruit bowl. And that makes it harder to find differences between sick and healthy people. It also makes it harder to find good tests, and it makes it harder to test treatment options. So um, I, I, I've heard from uh, Dr. Hawkins, he agrees we have a definite or undisputed Lyme disease category where even using standard reference testing uh, and, uh, and rock solid clinical criteria, that's what we've got. Dr. Fallon's done a lot of work with people who were so diagnosed but who had long-term symptoms afterward, the post-treatment chronic Lyme syndrome group. But I need to speak a little bit about what's going on in the northwestern part of the continent where most people coming forth clinically have been diagnosed on clinical grounds alone, supported by alternative tests, the validity of which is questioned by major reference labs. We'll call those alternatively diagnosed chronic Lyme syndrome just for now. So back to Pasteur. Um, I have to agree with, uh, with, with, uh, with, with Fallon and Datweiler that uh, what would he be doing if he were alive today? He'd be doing metagenomics, high throughput sequencing for microbial discovery. He'd probably be spending a lot of time figuring out what's going on in the gut microbiome as well. He'd be doing this host gene expression thing, the transcriptomics that Dr. Datweiler's talked about. He'd be looking at altered gene, uh, genes uh, in, in the science of epigenetics. And he'd also be taking a look at uh, different ways to study antibody expression in the immune system. And uh, basically, our research is using three of these, the metagenomics, the transcriptomics, and an immunosignature assay to begin to, to get better ideas about what may be going on with chronic fatigue syndrome and with people who have alternately diagnosed Lyme. Now, I, I had the pleasure of meeting Lyme advocates in BC back in 2010, and uh, they put forward three main things to me, that Borrelia bacteria were everywhere in ticks in BC with plenty of strain variation, that specialty labs do a better job of finding Lyme disease than reference labs, and that people need more antibiotics than they get. Well, you, we all are going to discuss our different readings of the literature, but I can see well-designed studies that re have refuted those findings, at least in the BC setting. But that doesn't change the problem, which is that we're still looking at large groups of ill people. So, for example, in BC, not only do we, do we pick up 1,000 ticks off, uh, off healthy, uh, healthy people or pe people who are, who are ill who've had ticks identified on them, but we pick them up in the wild. And when you're looking for Borrelia there, you use a reference 
PCR primer that picks up the whole genus, basically. And we've tested it, and it'll pick up Maonii and that sort of thing. So that's what we do. And we only get Borrelia in 1 in 200 ticks in the Northwest, which is way, way lower than what you've got in southern Ontario or Nova Scotia or down in Connecticut, right? Um, so it's important to bear in mind that we are looking at a different epidemiology on the West Coast. I also wanted to elaborate a bit on why a lot of the medical profession, the majority of Dr. Hawkins' CMA folks, have difficulties with the alternate lab testing. And I have to thank Dr. Fallon for his forthright publication of his extramural evaluations of um, specialty labs in the States, um, because it was clear that these specialty labs were actually not better at finding Lyme disease when it was there. Um, and we had one specialty lab that used in-house interpretive criteria for Western blot that diagnosed fully 57% of healthy people, 23 out of 40 healthy people, as having Lyme disease. And of course, that's the approach uh, that, uh, that has been used by most people seeking alternative uh, testing on the West Coast. So what does that actually mean? This is the second stick figure you see. This, uh, in, in BC, let's say you've got 100 people testing for Lyme disease, about two in 1,000 test positive by reference methods. So let's bump that way up to 10 in 1,000 for those of you who think the reference methods are too insensitive, 1%. That's this green person here. And that person's going to get picked up in probability by the alternative lab, and it'll also be picked up by the reference lab, uh, according to Dr. Fallon's paper for the most part. But the problem is this. You get 57 other people out of those 100 who are given a false positive result for Lyme disease. So that means two things. It means that your positive predictive value, your likelihood of actually having the disease if you've got that test positive in your hands is less than 2%. It also means that this test was registering fully 57% incorrect results. So uh, you, if you wanna save your money in terms of a test like that, you could flip a coin and get 50-50 results and actually get more accuracy. So our concern, and mine is a, an infectious disease epidemiologist, is that these Tests are sold uh, in, in the States for profit. Uh, the labs that uh, uh, have produced them will sponsor meetings attended by advocates. Advocates are sometimes more likely then to suggest mentioning the, the, the alternative test to people. More people might get the test. And then predictably, a few people with Lyme, uh, this one person here, are joined by very many with a false positive test. What does this do in terms of public perception? it vastly amplifies the perception of disease burden, individual risk, and potentially the demand for the tests. And it's interesting, I mean, in, in this, we've got ill people, we wanna to get to the bottom of what's going on, but who benefits from this positive feedback loop? Think about it. Uh, I've also heard that one lab that was offering this kind of testing has uh, changed its tune, doing things differently, but I also need to say that any Canadian lab reporting with this much error would be required to issue recall warnings to its clients, even if it did move forward with a change to the testing platform. And so I agree with every, everybody, we need to keep it real here in Canada. We don't want to lower our standards um, um, by going with, uh, with uh, untried technology. Now, diagnostic misdirection has its risks, delay in finding an underlying cause, and we've seen that with MS and cancer, um, risks associated with certain treatments. All treatments have risks, and you only want to take them when they're clearly a benefit. But I think also we're seeing the potential for exclusion from involvement in research that may come up with a better answer. I mean, right now, there's a lot of investment going on by NIH and CIHR and chronic fatigue syndrome and so forth. What we need is similar efforts to bring in people who have had a diagnosis of Lyme by, by any method. I also think this is a challenge for advocacy groups. I take my hat off to Can Lyme for helping people be more aware of the, uh, the, uh, the emergence of Lyme disease and areas of Canada where, where it's come in, particularly southern Nova Scotia and uh, southern Ontario. But I think it, 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 you've also done a great job of, uh, of indicating that we've got a large bunch of ill people here and bringing political attention to it. But you also, in my opinion, have to say, well, what if some of those people don't actually have Lyme disease? What if that's not the answer? And uh, we've got to dig a little bit deeper to be sure that we, we understand what's going on with everybody. And I think we've got a heterogeneous mix here, as some of uh, the other speakers have talked about. So is it more important that we be perceived as correct or that we find a better answer for some of those who we represent? 
So why would we research um, chronic Lyme syndrome or post, post-treatment chronic Lyme? Well, people are sick and dis- disabled. I understand the outrage and skepticism. I, I've seen, uh, seen, seen what people are going through. But disagreement on cause should not cause people to be selected away from studies. So we've done a little bit of pilot work here in BC, uh, not large studies, but trying to get into the omics revolution with chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, with a group of alternately diagnosed chronic Lyme. And I have to tell you, we looked very hard. We turned over the books in clinics for post-treatment chronic Lyme in BC. And not surprisingly, in an area where Lyme disease objectively diagnosed is somewhat low prevalence, they were hard to find. So everybody went through a detailed clinical assessment, reviewed for case definitions, and consented for uh, the study. And it's really important. I want the, the, I'd like the press to take a look at this. Take a look at the Karnofsky score on the on the on the left hand side there. You're looking at alternately diagnosed chronic Lyme and chronic fatigue being down around 60. That's a level of disability that um, is not compatible with being able to uh, to work uh, at a full time job. And these were ambulatory people who were able to come in. There are many people who can't come in for studies because they're they're, they're too too sick. So the physical disability was really clear. But all of these other scales, mental health scales, actually didn't distinguish very much uh, between people, um, arguing against the idea that this would be sort of in, in people's heads. We did take a lot of time characterizing people with chronic fatigue and alternately diagnosed Lyme. Every aspect of the history and physical exam, their lab testing, and they were very, very similar. And we also found that no patient diagnosed with Lyme disease by alternate methods could be confirmed by any form of reference testing, not just North American Western blots, but Western blots for European strains, a whole array of uh, serology for other tick-borne diseases. So it's still worthwhile trying to find out what could be going on. Now, those of you who are going to be skeptical about the reference test will say, well, the alternate test could be false positive. That's, That's right, Dave. But... Couldn't the reference test be false negative too? So we sort of looked at those probabilities. As we pointed out, positive predictive value of only 2% with the alternative test based on Fallon's published study and prevalences in the test population in BC would mean that 98% of the time with an individual test, you get a false positive. So 98 times 98 all the way out to 12 times is 78%. It's pretty likely that we have a false positive test result explaining these findings. But what about the reference test, false negative? Let's give Dr. Hawkins his idea that the reference test is only, you know, 40% sensitive. So 60% of the time, if that's the case, you're going to come out false negative. Well, multiply 0.6 12 times, you get 0.2%. So it's not very likely. And in fact, it's 350 times less likely than the false, than the alternative test being false positive. So where do we go from here? Uh, metagenomics is the science of high throughput sequencing to look for, uh, for organisms in tissues. For example, we worked in blood, and I think you could well argue that we should be looking at a lot of other tissues in terms of future studies. Um, you've got to isolate the nucleic acid. You've got to run it through these sequencers. You get these data files. You've got to get rid of the junk, um, junk reads. You've got to get rid of the human, um, the human reads. And then you you can make comparisons between patients in terms of what can be found in the bloodstream uh, or not. So in our our hands so far, we're finding no big differences in blood, um, but that's probably not a big surprise to to anybody here. It's just a preliminary foray. Of more interest, particularly following what Dr. Datweiler said, we're working with uh, the CHU lab at UCSF on the transcriptomics. And this is the lab that has found and published a transcriptional signature for acute Lyme disease. I hope some of you saw that, but early on you've got 1,200 differentially expressed genes, which again might be a way of diagnosing Lyme even before serological tests can become positive. But I, I did get a report from Jerome bouquet that um, basically uh, none of our alternatively diagnosed Lyme people had this transcriptional signature. So once again, we may have false positive diagnoses, at least in BC. Um, In in, uh, the same hands, though, we've been looking for differentially expressed genes and chronic fatigue and, uh, and healthy folks. Not finding a great deal yet, but we're still not done with all of the analysis. I think one of the most promising technologies are these uh, peptide arrays uh, that allow you to take a look not just at individual antibodies, but uh, but there's actually 320,000 
uh, peptides sitting on one of these chips, and it allows you to get an idea of the, the array of epitopes to which your antibodies are, um, are, are expressed. And uh, we're finding interesting clustering within the, uh, the chronic fatigue syndrome group and beginning to get together with other groups to see if that's, uh, that's common. And we want to take a look to see if it could be uh, common with some of the folks with alter alternatively diagnosed chronic Lyme. But where do these things really need to go? Well beyond small uh, pilot studies, of course, uh, we want to see multi-center efforts. And something should come out of this meeting in the way of a research agenda in that area. We need um, new cases um, to be identified within our large population-based cohort studies. I don't know how many of you know, but we follow 150,000 Canadians prospectively for uh, can the development of cancer in Canada and the Canadian Partnership for Tomorrow. They have biobank specimens at baseline. And within this group, lots of people come down with various different illnesses, uh, diabetes, Crohn's disease, indeed Lyme disease, chronic fatigue syndrome. So it's possible actually with those biobank specimens within these studies uh, to draw much better inferences about causation, uh, pathophysiology, and so forth uh, for things that have, have been, a, a, been a mysteries. Um, and I think uh, ultimately what we want to do is make sure we invest properly in those things uh, and, and we do all kinds of the appropriate biobanking and you'll have ideas about the sorts of things that you'd want to see biobanked. But not just blood, stabilized RNA, um, stool, hair, all sorts of things. I'd like to just conclude by saying, really, if there's a consensus that solving problems for patients is more important than anything else, and I, I am reading that in absolutely everybody I've heard from, then, uh, and it's far more important than our current complete agreement on, on theory, then we'll increase the likelihood that the future of research and care will be better than the past. And uh, I'd like to basically uh, conclude by thanking all of the study participants. Um, it took a lot for the folks with uh, alternately diagnosed Lyme and chronic fatigue syndrome to get in and to, uh, to put their time in made a big difference. It took a lot of people to uh, put together a research team and a lot of help from a, a lot of labs in order to get um, everything accomplished. And of course, this is uh, where we hang out and uh, we hope to see any of you out there um, this summer or next winter. Thank you very much, David.